As this is a continuation, let's get right to it. Just how tall and how strong were these Nephilim giants? Once again, the Bible does not leave that to speculation, nor is it a matter for debate. It can't be. Uh, for one to say, oh, they weren't really giants, well, duh. Here's their height and strength. Uh, they were giants. Let's see. Here's the proof. David has many enemy giants, and yes, they were giants, much larger than the average human indeed. How do we know? Well, here's one, ish Bibinab, named for false gods of Persia and Babylon, it seems. Uh, this dude wanted to kill David. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. You ain't going to. The Bible doesn't say how tall he was. That's not there, not in this case, but we'll show you some that do. But... Uh, that he was the son of a, oh, what's that word? Giant. Thus, he was a giant. There you go. In this case, what we do know is he had at least superhuman strength, as his spear weighed 300 shekels of brass. How much is that? Well, estimates vary, but that's roughly about 133 pounds or 60 kilos, folks. Uh, that's a human, almost, <laughs> as a spear um, <laughs> that he was throwing. That's no joke. This guy had the strength to wield a spear that was that heavy. Wow. Uh, he's not the only one, though, as he is in the same ballpark as the strength, and now we're going to get the height, of Goliath. Let's look at it. Goliath carries a spear about 125 pounds, or 57 kilos, pretty much the same as this previous giant. There you go. So they had similar strength. The armor he wore was about 17 pounds, or almost 8 kilos in weight. Wow. That's what he carried on his body. And his height is estimated between 9 and 14 feet tall, depending on the cubit measure used. We're not even going to try to debate that. We'll just leave it as a ballpark. It's fine. If he's nine feet tall, that's a giant. Last we checked. Let's just say he was only nine feet tall. We'll leave it at that. That's big enough, but the girth of these monsters in strength was incredible. They have lost their size today as even supposed Nephilim bloodlines they've tried to preserve intact uh, somewhat have lost their size and strength uh, in diluted genes over the years because it usually takes a human woman uh, along with the giant. But you can know them by their doctrines especially, which we find in many places today. In fact, ruling the world. Even European elite bloodlines claim to hail from Poseidon. We've mentioned many times before with references, so we're not going to go back there. But a watcher fallen angel making them an Nephilim by their own admission. And they believe that gives them the right to divine rule. Oh, wait a minute. No, it gives them the right to be consumed even in spirit by eternal fire on the day of judgment. And that's it. They don't belong. And that, my friends, is Nephilim doctrine. It's the same with the Chinese emperors who claim to hail from dragon bloodlines. Who are the dragons? Well, Nephilim. Then there is Ag of Bashan, which scripture calls a giant very clearly. But not only that. The last of the pre-flood giants, essentially. He's the remnant. He's the last of them. Uh, when he dies off, uh, the pre-flood giants are gone. And we only have the post-flood giants, uh, which hail from the same, but still. Uh, in his case, he has a bed that was 14 to 18 feet tall. Again, we'll just keep with the ballpark. We're not going to go into specifics uh, on which cubit measure is accurate. Uh, though in their flood series, we do cover that some. Uh, or four to six meters tall, really indicating his height approaching such numbers. Uh, yeah, so he was massive. Uh, he was at least nine feet tall to 14 feet tall, just like Goliath. And just like ish Benab, or however you say his name. ish Bibinab, I believe. Even in Amos 2.9, Amorite giants are recorded as tall as cedar 
trees. Doesn't mean all Amorites were giants, but they were certainly among them, and many were. In many records, even when we read the story of Jacob uh, versus the Amorite kings in the book of Jubilees, also quoted in Genesis, which is quoting Jubilees because it doesn't give you the story, but it quotes the story from Jubilees. There you go. Not sure at what point in growth, but the cedars in the area of Israel uh, such as Lebanon, grow as tall as 40 meters or 130 feet tall. Now, again, the, the giants don't have to be quite that tall, but the point is they are towering in height, just as being as grasshoppers in their sight. Same thing. These aren't fairy tales. Uh, it's called scripture, and the record is clear. The Bible doesn't have fairy tales per se. Uh, when it tells you that it is giving you uh, an analogy, that's clear. Um, and pretty much it's the language couldn't be clearer, really. This really serves to identify how tall Enoch's 3,000 L's might be. Uh, it certainly is not the modern European measure, which is nonsense and doesn't fit anything. Because Enoch, Jubilees, and Genesis agree. In 2 Samuel 21, 20 and 1 Chronicles 20, verse 6, uh, one other fascinating record of Nephilim is some are recorded as having six fingers and six toes uh, on each hand and each foot, 24 digits total. Wow. This is another man from Gath, well, just like Goliath and his brothers, uh, who were also giants, and uh, he is as well. Gath is part of Philistia, the territory of the Philistines, and we know giants were among them. Not that all Philistines are giants, but they are among them, uh, and probably many. Uh, in the Septuagint, we have shown you before the gath uh are mentioned there in Genesis 10, those of Gath, uh, such as this man and Goliath and his brothers, and they were all giants. Uh, they're mentioned along with an odd group called the Hasmonim, or Hasmonim, or Hasmoneans, the same who came down from Sumeria from Modain, named for Ashmodai, as they are as well. In fact, as perhaps his lineage, hmm, Nephilim, they conquered the temple and did not give it back to Yehudia, Judea, but usurped the priesthood and temple practice and became the Pharisees, which is the origin of modern-day rabbinic Judaism, according to the Jewish encyclopedia, even, uh, or they are among them, very same, at least. Thus, their track remains, and this is why Yahushua called them the seed of Satan and the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Yahudim and are not, but do lie. Watch Gog of Magog, Psalm 83, War, Answers in 2nd Esther, even origin of the word Jew, for great detail on that topic. Try to debate that here. Be muted. Our channel, Our Rules. The Anakim, or sons of Anak, or Anunnaki, were known for being tall in scripture, and it doesn't mean a few inches above average height here. Uh, they were giants, as we already know. We know from Goliath, well after the flood, giants were 9 to 14 feet tall, at least his tribe. Uh, however, the first giants before the flood were titans, even taller, and as Nephilim are predominantly male, it seems uh, they have to mate with human women, uh, thus diluting their bloodlines, and their size would naturally diminish over time, but you can find their doctrines. You can still follow them. Some say, but Yahuwah said he would wipe out all flesh. We'll go and read Genesis, as we mentioned before, which has qualifiers for such statements. Don't ignore the qualifiers. They're there. Uh, for instance, all with the breath of life perished. Well, demons, Nephilim, their spirits are demons, do not have Yahuwah's spirit. They're a demon. Thus, in a manipulation, and they do not have the breath of life. So, they're not included in that statement. They are an abomination. But today, we don't see giants walking around because of this. But we do find many elites and royals who preserve their bloodlines and wish to dominate over mankind, just as the Nephilim did. It's the same ideology. 
Many think this is because they are racist, and they are. There's no doubting that. They think that they are, uh, you know, higher beings of sort. That's called racism. Uh, they believe they have the divine right to rule, though. Why? Because of their bloodline. Uh, that is Nephilim ideology. It's not Bible. Uh, it always has been Nephilim and Watcher ideology. Many of them, such as the Merovingian line we've covered before, actually claim to descend from Poseidon, a Watcher fallen angel who fathered ten giant kings or titans from Atlantis. They ruled Atlantis. They were five sets of twins, uh, in fact, according to that lore. Whether it's completely true or not, they wrecked the world, and they are the reason, predominantly, for the flood, them and others like them. Back to Jubilees 5, verse 2. Here's what happened, affirmed by Jubilees, and really Genesis, as well as Peter, Jude, Paul, and others, and lawlessness increased on the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way. Now, how does that happen? How does fle all flesh uh, corrupt its way? How can it do that? Well, it's orders, you'll see. That's another way of saying it in the same passages. By breaking the law of creation, uh, first not producing after their kinds, for one. And then DNA was being modified way back then. You're talking about angelic beings here. They had such knowledge. What we are seeing today in labs all over the world is not new science, folks. It is the return of the days of Noah. And these aren't brilliant men. They are incredibly stupid if they are men at all. Otherwise, they are Nephilim bloodlines, likely. Again, affirmation quoting first Enoch. Not just men. Check this out. Alike men and cattle, and beasts, and birds, and everything that walketh on the earth. Notice the focus on the surface of the earth. And all of those were wiped out, and only uh, choice pairs and whatnot survived. So Moses, who wrote Jubilees, does not mention fish here. Uh, perhaps the fish were altered, uh, you know, in ponds, lakes, etc., but the ocean versions, maybe not. Uh, or perhaps the incursion wasn't as bad there. Those on the surface of the earth were the ones wiped out, not marine life. And marine life, the only measure for the origin of species as a result, not land animals or old bones of men. They all rebooted in the flood. We covered that in Solomon's Gold series in detail. Uh, marine species did not, so they're the measure. Find the most biodiverse marine population on earth, and you find the origin of species. Watch Solomon's Gold series. We cover that. Uh, that is found in the land of creation, the land above the Garden of Eden, ancient Havila, named for Hava, Eve's curse of labor in childbirth, which proves to be the modern Philippines. Watch those videos. Try to debate over there. Not on this video, as we didn't prove that here, but we cite what we proved over there. Otherwise, be muted, no debate, in ignorance without reviewing our position, our channel, our rules. And then it says, all of them. And what's that mean? Every species, every single species. That's why all species on land had to be preserved in the ark. Now, some then say, well, if all, then how did Yahuwah find pure species for the ark? That's backwards reasoning. Uh, one will never understand scripture reading it that way, really. Yahuwah said there were at least two of each species. That's what he says, that were not corrupt. Thus, you can't go back and forget that in reading and trying to apply reason that is illogical to this passage. That's all. Corrupted their ways and their orders, and they began to devour each other, and lawlessness increased. There it is again on the earth sin. And every imagination of the thoughts of all men was thus evil continually. But wait a minute, that's Genesis understood through Jubilees, which is what you get from Jubilees, a second witness, even written by Moses as well. We prove it. We prove it in that book. Read it, uh, bookofjubilees.org. It's free in ebook. Download it and read the introduction. Again, try to debate 
over in that series, Answers in Jubilees, if you care to try, uh, but don't do it here. Our channel, our rules. Yes, the church and scholars ignore it willingly in stupidity. They do not test it. They hang on a few shallow points, uh, having never truly read it, except to ridicule Jubilees and Enoch especially, uh, which one can do with the Gospels, by the way, and they do. They pit them against uh, each other because they make themselves too stupid to try to reconcile and understand the differences, which are not actually differences, but the poor understanding of things like the Bible calendar versus the Pharisee calendar. They're not sure that there's two calendars. They don't even know that. So they don't even know to ask the simple question before even entering the passage, which calendar am I looking at here? Then they offer a complete failure in interpretation because they don't know. They live in willing ignorance. They choose to be. Claiming there was a discrepancy, right? No. They do it with everything because, well, they're not really scholars of the Bible. They are scholars of the occult in most cases. Verse 3, And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt indeed. Uh, in what way? Every, every species indeed. But this was specific to, and here it goes, And all flesh had corrupted its orders. They were breaking the law of creation to reproduce after their kind, and they were creating hybrids. Even Nephilim themselves are actually hybrids of two creatures that are not meant to breed according to Genesis 1. Uh, one cannot stick their finger in the eye of Yahuwah any worse than defiling his creation so. And this is why he will deal with this with the most dr drastic of measures. This will also bring the final judgment with fire. The same behavior. This is not a small thing to be marginalized or minimized. He had to replenish the earth as a result. He was not an angry God who woke up insane one day, which most churches actually teach, even if they don't realize it. Because uh, if you think about it, he was a righteous Elohim saving his creation. Any other characterization is false. He accomplished that in the flood and tipped the balance of power in the favor of man for thousands of years. Of course, his prophecies tell us these days of Noah will return. And we are there now. And all that were upon the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes. All species and all men except what he tells you later in the story, what remained preserved in Noah and his family, and at least two pairs of every kind of animal, seven pairs of unclean animals, in fact, uh, as well, by the way. None of those were manipulated or modified in DNA. Skip to Jubilee 7, uh, verse 22, and they begat sons, the Naphedim, or Nephilim, you could say, uh, but uh, you actually have uh, different words here and characterizations. Uh, they were all unlike. So they were different hybrid creatures of sort. And they devoured one another, so they turned on each other and killed each other. We see that in Enoch. We see that really uh, everywhere. And the giants slew the Nafil, and the Nafil slew the Eljo, or Elyo, really, uh, or perhaps that's elves. Who knows? Uh, and the Elyo, uh, mankind, and one man, another. I mean, when you watch uh, movies like Lord of the Rings, uh, you're, you're literally watching the pre-flood world before the flood. You know, they even talk about a Middle Earth, right, which would be up on the continents, uh, because even the ocean floor would be principally dry land with mega rivers, giant rivers worldwide running through them. Watch our Rivers from Eden series. Uh, for more on that, uh, again, try to debate that here without reviewing our position. Be muted. Our channel, our rules. But this gives you an idea that there were different characterizations, classifications, uh, you know, of these hybrid creatures. And it doesn't matter. They all slew everything. I mean, they, they just killed. They murder, 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 murder. It's what they do because it's what they are. And they remain so 
as demons. There's no such thing as a good demon. There's no such as a thing as a demon doing a good duty. Oh, no. It will have an agenda every time that leads to evil, period. Verse 24, And after this they sinned against the beast and birds and all that moveth and walketh on the earth. Again, we don't really see fish there, but probably the fish invoked earlier are those in ponds and lakes. Uh, not necessarily those in the rivers from Eden or what will become the ocean. And much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desire of men imagined vanity and evil continually. It was all about themselves. Whoa, that sounds familiar. Hmm. Because we have seen the days of Noah return, my friends. Back to 1st Enoch, let's go to chapter 9. Notice how in tandem 1st Enoch is with Jubilees and Genesis on this. That's why Peter, Jude, and Paul especially use their accounts to quote on the flood in addition to Genesis uh, because they use them as scripture as the temple priests exiled to Qumran did. I mean, that's what they say uh, if if scholars could only read of course but let's start in verse 9 and the women bore have born great giants were born giants and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness and now behold the souls of those who have died humans martyrs in the chamber for such within the earth just as we covered enoch records earlier watch earlier in the series are crying and making their suit to the gates of heaven, and their lamentations have ascended and cannot cease because of the lawless deeds which are wrought on the earth. In other words, the lawless deeds never end, not until when? Until the day of judgment. See, the demons will still be doing what they do, destroying until then. And that's when the wicked are judged and consumed along with all all of those demons again the only that remain are satan and you know some of his princes uh for uh a an attempt in uh temptation a thousand years later in which they fail and that's it fast forward to first enoch 15 verse 3 we're almost done here Wherefore have ye left the high, holy, and eternal heavens, talking to the watchers, and lain with women, and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, and taken to yourselves wives, and done like the children of earth, and begotten giants as your sons? Notice, sons, males especially. Uh, again, most records have Nephilim as typically male in gender. Verse 4, and though ye, the watchers, were holy, spiritual, well, wait a minute, just as Gadriel, Lucifer, now Satan, uh, was in the garden, these angels were holy up until, well, they weren't. Some have misunderstood this, and one even said in comments, uh, you know, they don't understand how Satan was in the garden uh, before he sinned, yet the point is really i mean missing the point uh perhaps in the movies like minority report where they had a pre-crime division uh that would punish people for crimes they didn't even commit yet uh but somehow could see into the future and knew they would because of course they could see into the future which is ridiculous and will never happen in any time of mankind <laughs> not in that sense some of them on has to commit the sin first, right? I mean, uh, until Satan sinned, he hadn't sinned. He was still righteous. Uh, he was still holy. And yes, one who is holy can sin indeed. Now, someone has to commit the sin first before being punished, period. And that's the way it's always worked. Anytime a law suggests otherwise, in fact, uh, or, oh, who knows, a military policy, perhaps, uh, it is just as evil as the act being condemned, really. Imagine an entire military strategy punishing those, even killing them for what they might do. 
oops, well, welcome to the U.S. war on terror, because that's how it operates. A war, it turns out, that the officials, even the president, can lie to the public about the intentions of other countries uh, or factions and get away with it, and in the case of Hillary Clinton, even fund the enemy, the terrorists. Uh, that's what Benghazi was all about. Yet somehow she still got to run for president. Good thing she lost. Living the eternal life. See, angels are intended to live eternally, as our spirits, spirits of men are as well. But you have defiled yourselves with the blood of women. Angels uniting with women is always defilement and always brings judgment. Always. It has never happened since the Watchers, or there would be scripture exposing it, period. Anyone adding such stories into the word is really operating as a Pharisee, adding leaven, expanding the word with a new story that doesn't exist, and unfortunately that comes with a curse. And have begotten children with the blood of flesh, and as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood, as those also who do, who die and perish. Now, I mean, this language is so super clear. This can be understood, folks. Genesis 6 can be understood. We have always had this continued uh, support from the other two witnesses. Skip to chapter 16 in First Enoch, verse 1. From the days of the slaughter and destruction and death of the giants, what happens after a giant dies? Get this. And remember, they're a Nephilim abomination. They're not supposed to be. From the souls of whose flesh the spirits, having gone forth, so the spirits have left their bodies now, their bodies are dead, just like humans. Their bodies die. And their spirits live on, but they don't have the breath of life. They don't have the spirits that men have. They don't have Yahuwah's spirit, Yahuwah's breath of life. So having gone forth shall destroy without incurring judgment. So their souls or spirits, yes, the Bible treats those two words interchangeably, really, regardless of what some stupid scholar trying to justify New Age says. Uh, watch our videos uh, on that in Where Do We Go When We Die? Now, these become demons. The Nephilim do. Their spirits are demons. They're demons when they're in their body. Uh, but when their bodies die, they become demons. The origin of demons is the Nephilim, which didn't come about until the days of Jared, the fifth generation from Adam. Thus, Cain could not be one. That is a false doctrine. Watch the serpent seed, 1 and 2, and the mystery of Cain, 1 and 2, and you will know that for sure. Uh, also, watch where do uh, from where do demons originate in Answers and Jubilees, and we explain that because Jubilees goes into detail. However, Yahuwah only locked away about 90% of the worst demons, also in that video. 10% remained under Satan's control, and that is the entire infrastructure of evil, other than, of course, men who follow them and their ideologies, of which most governments do today. What happens when a Nephilim dies, though? Their spirit has no place to go. They wander the dry places, Scripture says. Uh, watch that video, uh, and you'll see. This is why they, and only they, can reincarnate into the body of a human or even an animal. Yes, that doctrine is not only Nephilim, only their spirits, demons, can do so. Talk about a doctrine of demons. A human spirit cannot inhabit the spirit of another human. Never happens. That is a religion with demonic possession as their ideology in faith. And some wish to equate that to the Bible. Are you kidding? Uh, the Bible exposes it. Now, no, they're not doing that here. Enoch no, no, now tells us, how long these demons will be with us. Check this out. Thus shall they destroy, that's what they do, destruction, until the day of consummation. Now, the demon spirits of Nephilim continue to do what their adopted father, Satan, does. They kill, steal, and destroy, John 10.10, 10, all the way until the very end, or at least the end of this age. Now, what is that? 
the great judgment in which the age shall be consummated. Now, that didn't happen in the flood. Only bodies were consumed in the flood. We're talking about spirits. We're talking about demons being consumed and the spirits of men, the wicked, uh, as well as the watchers for that matter. So, which have not been consumed yet, but their judgment is pronounced to be on the day of judgment, right? Okay, so the great judgment in which the age shall be consummated over the watchers and the godless, yea, shall be wholly consummated. So it'll be consumed on what day? The day of final judgment, period. So we'll get to this timing, but though the watchers were punished and imprisoned in the flood, Right? They, they await their final judgment, just as a man awaits his judgment in a trial. Uh, so he's imprisoned uh, until he is found guilty, sentenced for his crime. Right Now, Yahuwah already knows they're guilty. That's not in question. But this will happen on the day of judgment, and that hasn't occurred yet. They are in prison still. They don't escape. They don't get visitors. No one can communicate with them in any sense, not even demons or even Satan. And if you hear someone saying they do, they're talking to demons. They're not talking to the watchers. They are gone, and they don't get released. Uh, they are silent, and they will be until their consummation, the end. Their end, and then... They will be consumed with eternal fire, which is why it is called the day of consummation here in Enoch. It is the final day of judgment. And for them, and, well, the Marvel Comics, Nephilim, the end. Only Satan and a few of his princes again will remain, uh, and they'll be in prison then, and held over for a thousand years in order to be loosed for a short time, only to fail, proving that mankind that is left the righteous uh, will no longer fall to his temptation. He fails. Then he will be consumed as well. We have answered some in comments who have been taught that the day of judgment occurs after the thousand years. And I just want to address this really quickly in this video. We're not going to do one on it, at least not anytime soon. Uh, we, we probably will in some in, at some point later. However, if you go back and truly read Revelation 20, John is discussing Satan, and he fast-forwards uh, on this narrative uh, to basically Satan's end, when he's released, fails, and then consumed. But then, he immediately comes back in time, uh, to, to the same time on the Day of Judgment, a thousand years earlier than that again. So he returns. He goes forward just to tell you what's going to happen to Satan. And then he comes back. Very logical, very rational way for him to deal with that. Anyone reading that that way, though, will always misunderstand it. Uh, he, he doesn't uh, go forward and stay there. He comes back. You've got to read it. So it's there. If you read it, truly read it. Read it several times if you have to. You'll get it. And that, my friends, is the Nephilim, the pre-flood giants who were the result of the union of watcher fallen angels defiling themselves in sin with human women. This narrative has never been in question in the biblical ecclesia, uh, which, by the way, even the Dead Sea Scroll community taught this. Only the false church, pretending to be his ecclesia, fronts with such nonsense uh, teaching against it when the New Testament teaches the same thing. And this is one of many issues that they've screwed up. They don't even know what they are doing, most scholars that is, uh, because they, they just don't see it, even though it's right in front of their nose, because they're steeped into a paradigm. They're boxed in and they can't see outside of the box. However, when we do not know our enemy, well, Hosea 4, 6, my people perish from lack of knowledge. That same church will say some of the dumbest things, like, you know, oh, we should only focus on our salvation. Yet, salvation is a relationship with Yahushua, which is exactly what we're doing in this. And there is no other name by which men are saved, and no other way, that's for certain. Uh, there is no salvation in Islam, by the way. 
Uh, and no, not Krizlam either. Rick Warren is a fool. No salvation in becoming a guru using excerpts of the Bible for your own pocketbook uh, in New Age fraud, such as Joel Osteen. No salvation in telling people, well, they just say a prayer and check a box, as most of the church does. But even John MacArthur, who's supposedly the origin of that doctrine, um, it's idiotic. Uh, of course, that guy also attacks the Sabbath, the biblical law, uh, while claiming to be the minister of the gospel. He's the minister of lawlessness. He is a minister of sin, by definition. That gospel is Satan's, and it is lawlessness. It is the same as the Nephilim before the flood, and the earth makes accusation against him and those others who are doing the same. These are not men we should look up to. They should be and they will be condemned for leading the lambs to slaughter. And that unfortunately permeates the modern church. But us lambs, we are awakening. We are reading the Bible for ourselves and restoring the truth of Scripture. And we say no more deceivers. You can't fool us any longer. We see you. We know our enemy. This is one of the most important topics of our age. It explains why Yahuwah had to bring the flood and puts history, true history, into perspective. And yes, my friends, this is history. We could care less what stupid academic tries to redefine the term history while ignoring the oldest written history in, by human hands ever. That's called willing ignorance by Peter, 2 Peter 3, and they make themselves fools. That's their decision. It doesn't have to be ours. It is time for all of us to stand firmly on the word, to know it for ourselves, to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And so we shall. We have over 400 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year now, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos, and now six in Spanish to start. We're hoping for more uh, if anyone wishes to volunteer on the Spanish side. We're uh, willing to uh, entertain. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will uh, notify yourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. We now have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our podcast is available for all of our videos pretty much as well. All links in the description box. Friend us on Facebook at The God Culture space hyphen space original. If you prefer an alternative, we now have Parlor link below. We now have six books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries, with our new release, The First Book of Enoch, the oldest book in history, and we prove it right there in the introduction from the outset. Uh, also in this series in the beginning, we touch on that, but more so in the book. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book, a uh, dynamic piece, pictorial piece, uh, in the case for Ophir. Uh, in the U.S., Canada, U.K., many overseas markets on Amazon. Uh, there, it's available in hardcover or softcover as an option. Uh, and, of course, it's still available here in the Philippines as well. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, uh, now with color maps and interior overseas, which many had requested. Uh, we already have the color maps in the Philippines, uh, but that, too, is available in hardcover in color or soft cover in color as well as black and white and the book of enoch is as well on amazon in all three platforms uh here in the philippines it's just available in black and white all books including solomon's treasure are now free in ebook just go to ophirinstitute.com for all the links for your area for all of our books more coming soon thank you for watching now always remember Prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.